Say Gaiden episode 56 takes the initiative. The global defense initiative, that is. An enemy missile attack has been launched Oh dear, the I've left the oven on. Good. The Reagan era gave us lots of dumb, bad things. And here in its final days, Sega decided to pay homage to one of the dumbest and worst things of that time. Not that Mr. Reagan had the presence of mind to appreciate the tribute at that point. And it's not as though Sega made the reference particularly obvious in the Master System version of the game. Global defense could mean any number of things, really. Sega wisely realized that maybe good localization practices would entail not publishing a game under a title that made an explicit reference to a discredited political boondoggle. In arcades, Global Defense shipped under the name SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, a name that, by 1988, would have come off more as satire than serious. The real SDI, better known as Star Wars, was a concept that emerged during Ronald Reagan's first term as president, during the latter days of the Cold War, shortly after the president very tactfully referred to the Soviet Union as the evil empire and kicked the doomsday clock forward a notch or two. In principle, SDI made sense, a network of computer-guided precision weapons that would create an effective barrier against incoming ballistic missiles, using lasers and particle weapons to protect America, and maybe our allies, against inbound nukes. In practice, SDI landed somewhere between maybe in a few decades and risible fantasy nonsense. Even if it had worked, many critics felt it would have circumvented the mutual assured destruction balance that prevented the East and West from initiating direct hostilities, sparking a global apocalypse. Between 1983 and 87, the concept soaked up countless millions in research money, which the government presumably had to spare, thanks to all the social services Reagan shut down, before the group assigned to the task sheepishly admitted that the whole venture had effectively gone nowhere and it quietly disappeared. Well, at least until Reagan's true heir, another media personality with no real understanding of the underlying mechanisms of governance, revived the concept in 2019 as part of the preposterous Space Force concept. So, you can understand why, in the time between SDI's April 1987 debut in arcades and its March 1988 arrival on Master System, Sega quietly decided to give it a little bit of a rebrand. Although critics derisively referred to Reagan's SDI concept as Star Wars to highlight the president's tendency to conflate media fiction with actionable policy, SDI didn't really resemble the Star Wars movies all that much. I mean, sure, space lasers, but when you think Star Wars, the movies, it's not really ballistic countermeasures that come to mind. Rather, SDI came off more like someone at the White House had played a lot of Missile Command and then thought, hey, why not sink a chunk of our GDP into making this a reality? The problem with this, of course, is that the presumptive administrator in question completely failed to understand the underlying premise of Missile Command, which is to say that nuclear war is a hopeless endeavor that eventually ends in extinction. But hey, look at those pretty flashing lights. And fittingly, that's precisely the concept Sega keyed in on while designing their game, SDI. The arcade release played more or less like a next-generation take on Atari's Missile Command incorporating additional axes of challenge into the gameplay by untethering the player's missile bases from the ground and dropping them into space. In the original Missile Command, players needed to simply control a targeting reticle in order to lay down explosives that would intercept and destroy incoming attacks. SDI turned the missile base into a satellite, keeping a low Earth orbit, forcing players to maneuver the base out of harm's way while targeting incoming threats. This setup relied on a complex and somewhat intimidating dual interface combination in which players steered the satellite with a joystick and steered the crosshairs around the screen with a trackball. Once you wrapped your head around this two-fisted approach though, it worked pretty well, in arcades. On a home console, well, the newly rechristened SDI faced an uphill battle. Not that there are any hills in space, but you know what I mean. Now, unlike a certain competing console, the Master System did have a trackball option available in 1988. Global Defense could technically have attempted to duplicate the arcade format, allowing one player to use a D-pad in one hand while rolling a trackpad with the other. Or you could even have used the Master System control stick instead of the D-pad. Technically, I think it might actually be possible to do this. Global Defense includes an optional two-controller mode that allows you to steer the satellite with one D-pad and the crosshair with the other. If you are fortunate enough to have a working Sega sports pad, a big ask in the year 2023, you might be able to duplicate the arcade setup. 
Of course, you need some sort of jury-rigged device to hold them secure, since both the control stick and the sports pad are lightweight controllers designed to be manipulated with one hand and secured with the other. But in theory, this could work if you really, really like Global Defense enough to go to these ridiculous lengths. For the rest of us, Global Defense on Master System simply assumes a single controller and incorporates an alternating control scheme. By default, the D-pad directs the placement of the targeting reticle, allowing it to careen around the screen and take aim at missiles. Guide the cursor around space, hit the attack button to launch counter-strikes, and save the Earth from nuclear bombardment. However, this does nothing to protect your satellite from incoming threats that target it directly. A satellite on a fixed flight path has about 10 seconds of viability before a strange crab-shaped robot homes in on it and destroys it. No, in order to keep yourself safe from more directed threats, you need to make use of the controller's secondary function. Hold button 2 on the controller and you enter Direct Guidance mode. In this mode, rather than steer the targeting cursor, the D-pad instead steers the satellite itself. You're effectively incapable of attacking in this mode. You can only fire in whichever direction you happen to have pointed the cursor before switching control focus. But on the plus side, you don't need to worry about taking it on the chin from a missile or crab mech this way. Gameplay alternates in this fashion as you toggle between control inputs as needed to take out or dodge projectiles. In theory, I suppose you could be such an amazing player that you can simply remain fixed in space and take out every threat that targets you directly, but again, in practice, that would require tremendous memorization and ultimately probably wouldn't be that fun. The split control setup works surprisingly well, all things considered. Sega accounted for the lack of simultaneous control focus when programming this conversion making the game a touch easier than the coin-op release, with new patterns that alternate between fire-and-forget projectiles and threats that home in on the satellite. The result is one of the most faithful arcade-to-master-system ports we've seen to date. Certainly, there's more fidelity here than we saw in Alien Syndrome. Global Defense doesn't reinvent the game dramatically, the way Action Fighter did, but it doesn't flounder. It's more in line with Fantasy Zone or Wonder Boy, at least in terms of authenticity. In terms of actual content, though, it does feel simpler and less substantial. With its two-phase offense-defense structure, Global Defense plays like a spiritual kin to Missile Defense 3D. In fact, it even shares a common thread of fatalism. In Global Defense, a small meter at the bottom of the screen steadily fills every time a missile or warhead slips past your defensive attacks. Once the meter reaches maximum, the game ends, regardless of how many satellites you have in reserve. Certainly, Global Defense has a more robust design than the simple light gun shooter that preceded it, but only just. Like its fellow Missile Command-inspired sibling, this game lacks the meteor additions that Sega had begun to incorporate into their arcade conversions and action games throughout 1987. Consider the elaborate network of stages found in Fantasy Zone 2, the non-linear seek-and-find layout of Zillion, or even the Master System's maze-like flip-screen interpretation of the aforementioned Alien Syndrome. Outside of superscalar conversions, Sega had begun to shift its console action game design ethos to better accommodate the needs of the home experience, and Global Defense has a quick, slight design, more reminiscent of the first year of Master System releases than of its current lineup. That isn't necessarily a flaw, more like a growing divide in Sega's game design ethos as the company takes its consumer business more and more seriously. We'll see just how seriously by the end of 1988, at least in Japan anyway. What happens when you create a sequel that strips away the element that gave the original work its name in the first place? Sega is playing with semantic fire here with Zaxxon 3D for Master System. You remember Zaxxon, of course, or at least you should remember Zaxxon, Easily one of the coolest arcade games of the early 1980s and a massive breakout hit for Sega. Zaxxon represented many firsts. It's said to have been the first arcade game ever to receive its own television commercial in the US. And I'm pretty sure it was the first arcade game to make use of inverted flight yoke controls. And while not the first to use forced perspective graphics to represent 3D space, if nothing else, it was preceded by Sega's own Congo Bongo, which lent its board to Zaxxon. It certainly was the first shooter in this style to gain any traction in arcades. That graphical approach, which used a perspective-free raised style called an axonometric viewpoint, lent Zaxxon its name. Z-Axon. Zaxxon. It represented Sega's answer to the question of the hour. How do you improve on Konami's scramble? Sega's true rival Namco answered by presenting the scramble mentality, that is, dual combat axes with air-to-air -air fire and air-to-ground bombs, 
from a strictly top-down perspective in Zevius, landing a huge hit in Japan. Zaxxon seems to have fared better in the West thanks to its more stunning visual style, but fundamentally, it was just as much of a scramble variant as Zevius, if not more so. Zaxxon lacked dual weapon commands, giving players access to forward fire only. Instead, it matched Scramble's integration of aerial and air-to-ground attacks by allowing the player to adjust the altitude of their fighter craft, as in Scramble, in addition to making lateral movements, as in Zevius. And just to drive home the connection, Zaxxon retained Scramble's energy mechanic, which required players to blast fuel depots along the way in order to keep their craft powered up. So, the name Zaxxon 3D sounds inherently redundant, given that the original Zaxxon made its initial splash on the market by being, you know, convincingly 3D. This release makes the 3D more directly literal. It implements the Sega 3D glasses in order to create a more standard illusion of the third dimension. Understandably, the game's entire presentation style changes to accommodate this hardware gimmick, although the 3D glasses would probably pair up with the classic isometric visuals to create a pretty cool diorama effect. That's not the direction Sega went here. Instead, Zaxxon 3D plays more like Sega stepped back and said, what if Zaxxon had come out a year or two later? Which is to say, what if Zaxxon had shipped for the VCO object arcade platform? Which is to say, in turn, that Zaxxon 3D essentially plays like Zoom 909 with a sprinkling of Zaxxon elements. The camera has shifted here to a behind-the-ship view, and the 3D glasses cause everything in space to fly toward you. However, Sega seems to have anticipated that people would be presenting this game to YouTube viewers decades later and offered the option to turn off the 3D effect, which kind of undermines the core premise of this update and makes it just another shooter. And honestly, a fairly unremarkable one at that. Each stage of Zaxxon 3D consists of two phases, kind of like global defense in a way. First, you have the space approach sequence in which you exchange shots with tiny starfighters. Survive that free space shootout and you move along to the fortress phase, which attempts, not entirely successfully, to recreate the feel of Zaxxon's memorable fortress sequences. I guess it kind of hits the mark. I mean, you have to maneuver down long corridors where gun emplacements fire forward to turn the lower altitudes into a hazardous space, you have to fly over walls and stuff, and yeah, there are fuel tanks. But something is lost here, including all of the interesting visual design elements along the ground along with a sense of a cramped, claustrophobic space where precision maneuvers win the day. It doesn't help that the game adopts a slow burn approach. It doesn't even really feel like Zaxxon until you reach the fourth fortress. That's the point at which you begin to see elements like subterranean missile silos, which fire into space as you move near, and energy barriers, whose force beams span the width of the fortress at differing heights. What I'm saying is that you don't really experience true Zaxxon until about 10 minutes into the game. And because you only have three lives and zero continues, you have to slog through the boring buildup every time you run out of lives. A perfectly acceptable experience the first couple of times you play, but one that grows profoundly boring once you get the hang of the action. To make matters worse, Zaxxon 3D has some of the most hostile checkpointing you'll ever see. Every time you die, you go back to the beginning of the approach sequence for the current stage, no matter how far into that stage you may have advanced. I suppose the idea behind the absolute lack of checkpoints was to pad playtime, and more charitably, to let you stock your fighter with power-ups before reaching the fortress. Yes, just as Zaxxon took cues from Scramble, Zaxxon 3D seemingly takes cues from Scramble's successor, Gradius, and adds a primitive power-up system. Eh, that's probably a stretch. The upgrade scheme here has more in common with something like Darius. The only real commonality it shares with Gradius is the importance of stacking speed upgrades, and the fact that once you die, you go back to your default speed, which kind of feels like wading through mud. The Zaxxon 3D fighter can collect two upgrade types, and players can toggle between any of the three guns they have in hand by pressing button two. There's not really that much of a difference between them, though. You won't find piercing lasers or enemy-seeking spread beams or anything like that here. Each of the optional gun upgrades shoots the same single forward shot as the default weapon, simply offering a little more power and a faster firing rate than the standard gun. The downside of the upgrades, and the reason you will sometimes want to toggle back to the default, is that the more powerful weapons drain your fuel reserve more quickly when fired. This makes them especially tricky to use in the approach scenes, which lack fuel tanks and force you to rely on the rare fuel boost drops that enemy fighters may leave behind. It's a little underwhelming, though not as underwhelming as the bosses that appear at the end of each stage. At least as far as I've made it into the game anyway, they just kind of hover in space and soak up your fire. 
As in the space approach scenes, your only real cue to indicate when you and the enemy have reached the same altitude comes in the form of a tiny firing reticle at the tip of your fighter's nose cone. But if you use one of the alt weapons, you can potentially destroy some of the bosses before they even warm up to attack. All in all, I'd characterize this as a pretty lackluster follow-up to one of the all-time arcade super hits. Zaxxon 3D relies entirely on the 3D effect of the glasses to elevate a fairly mediocre tube shooter, an effect that the game allows you to toggle off entirely should you so choose, and one that's almost impossible to recreate now without going to unusual lengths. In other words, it's not the sequel we deserve. As for what Sega Challenge had to say, well, unlike Alien Syndrome and Aztec Adventure from last episode, neither of which received more than passing mention, both Global Defense and Zaxxon 3D enjoyed a fair amount of official corporate hype. Global Defense enjoyed a nearly full-page feature, including tips in the second issue of the Sega newsletter, and Zaxxon 3D showed up as a massive two-page spread in that same issue, a shared feature with a promotion for the Sega 3D Glasses hardware itself. Next time on Say Gaiden, could it be a sequel to Snail Maze? <laughs>